Energy visionary, political philanthropist, entrepreneur T. Boone Pickens using business expertise and political insight in a conservative agenda. A conversation with T. Boone Pickens on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Iowa banks know you want honest advice about how to best reach your financial goals, whether it's financing and education, buying a new home, growing a business, or funding retirement. Iowa banks, Iowa values. MyIowaBank.com Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa public television. This is the Friday, January 24 edition of Iowa Press. Here is Dean Borg. Certain people seem to have a knack for getting things done, born achievers, seemingly defying age, pursuing new agendas. That description fits T. Boone Pickens. Well, as the story goes, at age 12, Mr. Pickens took over a 28-customer newspaper route and quickly expanded it to 156. A geology degree from Oklahoma State University set him on a career in the petroleum industry and acquiring major companies. He's now leveraging his wealth in a conservative political agenda and, somewhat surprisingly, in trying to wean the nation away from foreign energy by promoting alternative sources, particularly wind and solar energy. Mr. Pickens, welcome to Iowa. Welcome Thank to you. Iowa Press. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Across the table, James Lynch, who writes for the Gazette, published in Cedar Rapids, and Radio Iowa News Director, Kay Henderson. As an oil man who's now an advocate of alternative fuels, what is your view of corn-based ethanol? I, uh, I say I'd rather have ethanol than OPEC oil. That ethanol, I, I know how it all happened. And uh, I was there when Bob Dole explained to me there's 21 farm states and they have 42 senators. They want ethanol, we're gonna have ethanol. Okay, fine, it's American. Anything American's fine with me. But OPEC oil, when we buy oil from OPEC, which is about four and a half million barrels a day, some of that money gets into the hands of the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And I, Jim Woolsey, former CIA director, he and I are in agreement on this. And I, I would like to cut out all OPEC oil. We, some part of that can go to ethanol, that's fine with me. Um, right now, the ethanol industry is engaged in what it characterizes as a fight against big oil over an EPA decision to cut back the amount of ethanol that's required to be blended into gasoline this year. Um, what's your view of the EPA's role in this whole decision-making process? And as a former oil man, what's your view of this concept of big oil? The concept of what? Of the bad old big oil. Bad old big oil? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, Trying to push away other sources of energy. Well, bad old big oil, you know, I had uh, some encounters with them. Uh, one, first, was City Service, second, Gulf, third, Phillips, and fourth, Unical. So I have some real experience with big oil. The, uh, I don't, I don't, to me, I don't pay that much attention to them. Because one, when you look at Exxon, 81% uh, of their revenues come from offshore. So what is Exxon? Exxon is a international company. And to pay any attention to them on domestic oil issues, uh, if you want to listen to them, fine. I, I think their agenda is an international But agenda. they seem to be leveraging a lot of political support in trying to suppress 
uh, the, the use of ethanol. Uh, do you do you feel that same way? No, because I, I don't. I, I'm not focused on that. I understand the ethanol issue and all, and I, I'm not against the ethanol issue. But it's uh, not a big priority with you. No, it is not. I'm not in the business mm -hmm. of ethanol. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I don't feel like it's competition to me, so I don't. But, uh, you, but just follow that line of thinking. You are in the business, though, of trying to wean the nation away from foreign oil, and ethanol is being proposed as a way of helping to do that. Well, so ethanol, I said three minutes ago, Anything American, I'm for, mm -hmm. and so it's uh, that's it. It's that it's that simple. I I want American, and, but the missing link that we have is we have no energy plan. I mean, just let me just take you down a trail for a second. Is one we're now talking about exporting oil from the United States, and we're importing about eight million barrels a day. Now half of it from Canada and Mexico, I'm quite comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with the four million that we're getting from OPEC. So here, the Commerce Department is now has the question, uh, are we gonna export oil? Then you look at the Keystone Pipeline, guess who has a question on their desk? The State Department. What? The State Department, Commerce Department, it, there's nobody that makes decisions on energy in America. Say well, the Energy Department. Nah, they they they're absolutely have no, uh, as I see, input to the question. You're going to have to deal with the issue of the SPR at some point, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Well, you have 700 million barrels of oil in storage that you don't need. Energy's changed in America. So, so what will be the catalyst to bring about? a national energy policy uh, in a country that has been talking, people like you and others have been talking about this as a national security issue, nothing's happened for decades. It hasn't, no, exactly. But so what's going to ha what's gonna have change no, the calculation? You have no plan. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what, will change the, what will change the calculation and cause there to be a plan? Well, okay, think about that. Usually it's price. I mean, if you had gasoline prices go up to five dollars, well, all the politicians they they'd want to have a hearing and inquiry. What what's going? Who's gouging who? How's this all happening? How could that happen to us? That isn't going to happen to us. You're not going to have gasoline prices. Get yeah. too into the conversation, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I'm we'll, sorry. we'll change uh, fuels here for a second. Uh, while temperatures outside have been plunging, we've seen propane gas prices spike up to nearly five dollars a gallon. And is this just a natural market reaction to the demand for propane at this time of the year, or is this being manipulated, or is it a result of exporting propane, which I guess you oppose exporting our domestic fuel? The, I don't, no, I'm not, I'm not opposed to exporting products. I mean, we're, we're exporting now about three million barrels a day of products mm -hmm. out of the United States. But what's happened is your refineries <coughs> are set to process Mideast crude. Why did that happen? Because 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we thought in America you were going to rely more and more on uh, OPEC crude. So the refineries tried to get ahead of it. They uh, designed and did a good job, and they're the best refiners in the world today. But they would rather see heavy uh, crude come into them instead of uh, light sweet, because we thought we were going out of the light sweet business. That all changed with the Bakken, uh, the Eagleford, and uh, West Texas. We've got light sweet again. So what do we do? I'd leave it up to the refiners to figure that out, but I would start to cut down on the OPEC crude, open, take the Keystone Pipeline, but that'll get you a lot of crude that would fit American refining right now. Back to Jim's question on propane. Uh, Jim, you can restate it if you like. Well, I, I'm just wondering, it. is it a natural reaction to the demand for propane? It is. What's happened to you is turn cold. Mm -hmm. And it's real cold. And consequently, you, I guess you could sit around if you were in the propane business and say we, we're going to have propane to fit any kind of winter that we might have. Well, they're carrying a lot of inventory at that point. 
and they don't want to do it. They've designed for a normal winter and they didn't get it. It's colder than normal. And consequently, demand is strong for propane. Price goes up and the only way you can kill demand is with price. So the price will kill demand at some point. But I mean, it's sort of a lifeline for a lot of people who heat their homes mm -hmm. with propane. It, it's, they're subject to these price spikes. Um, and is there a way to avoid crippling those families that are trying to, in some cases, pay more for their propane than their mortgage? Well, it's a, it's a tough question, of course, and, and somebody is, uh, is struggling because of the price of propane. But now, where can we look to get relief? Are we gonna tell, no, you can't sell the propane for $5 a gallon? Well, I don't know, I mean, now we have price controls, and so. For, for the past several years, you've been an advocate of using natural gas as a fuel to uh, motorized uh, vehicles in the country. Is that practical? Has it caught fire because I have no opportunity in my neighborhood of fueling up with natural gas. It, is, it isn't available to you? No. Well, it's, uh, it's the fuel <laughs> if you can get to it. Well, she, she heats her house, I'm sure, with natural gas, but that's oh. not a but way I'm, to get I'm the vehicle. I'm asking about, oh, for you, vehicle. Are you're, you are advocating for vehicles, for the motor vehicle No, fleet. actually what, I, what I'm after is heavy duty trucks. Right. Okay. And <clears throat> there, if, if you take out the heavy duty, what we call class five through eight uh, heavy duty trucks, that is about three million barrels of oil a day. You could cut 75% off of OPEC with heavy duty trucks in America, but you have no plan. But it's happening anyway. And it's happening because the, when you take natural gas to a diesel gallon, it's half the price. It's $2 a gallon cheaper than diesel. And so that is, you're moving in that direction very fast. And last night I was here and went to a great dinner and, uh, uh, and uh, some of the, I think, supporters of, of the program today that you have going on. And I had two truckers talk to me and they said, you know, you gotta look at it. It's too cheap to, to pass up. Now, when you do that, you're going to have to buy a different uh, tractor. Mm -hmm. And how much more is that going to cost you, the tractor over a diesel tractor? And, and excuse me. Okay. I, I didn't want to interrupt, but you have talked about the lack of a plan, energy plan. And six years ago, you introduced your Pickens plan. And one of, the, one of your goals was to reduce energy imports by 30% or oil imports by 30% over 10 years. We're more than halfway towards that 10-year goal. How are we doing uh, and what needs to happen to, to achieve those goals? We're doing great. Actually, we, we have cut back on, on oil. But the, again, in the absence of a plan, if you're gonna have a plan, you know, get off of uh, the OPEC oil as a place to start. And you immediately see Keystone is, would be a real advantage for us to, to take the Canadian oil. But if we, we're moving in the right direction without a plan. So somebody said, well, just leave it alone, it'll all happen anyway. I, I think you need an energy plan, and we only men briefly mentioned SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, 700 million barrels is sitting there. That was a plan that, that came into existence in 1974. For national security. Exactly because we'd had that M Arab embargo. Right. And so we said, get some oil in storage in the event this happens to us again. But now you seem to say it's a waste to it, have that plan, that you, reserve. You don't need the, uh, you know how, how much the most we've taken out of the SPR. The, we've, we've removed four or five times, but the largest amount we've taken out, one was in Katrina and I can't remember the other, is 28 million barrels. You don't need 700 million barrels in there. And again, we have no energy plan. But what you seem to imply is that the, the need for a strategic oil petroleum reserve is past no, uh, national security is not any more threatened. That's what you seem to be saying. I, I am saying that, exactly. You, uh, if you, if you wanna make the, the uncomfortable ones comfortable, take out 
half of it, okay? But to remove half of it out of there and not disrupt the market, it's gonna take you 10 years. And, and we don't have a, a national security problem anymore because we have alternative sources other than the Middle East, is that why? Yes, and we have oil. I mean, we're the only country in the world that's increased oil reserves and production. Yeah. But see, in 1970, we hit 10 million barrels a day. And 73, we had the Arab embargo. In 70, you started to decline in the United States. The 10 million barrels a day started down. It went all the way down to four and a half. We're back up to eight. We are back up to eight. Mm -hmm. And so we have done an unbelievably good job in this country. And we have resources uh, that are running out our ears. And we should have an energy plan. Somebody should sit down and say, okay, let's see what the resources are. Sounds like we don't need a plan. But okay, well, th and people say that. And they say, we're working our way out of it. But you still have 700 million barrels sitting over here in storage that you don't need. So that should be addressed. And you sh you're going to have to come to the, the decision whether you want to export or not. You're going to have to address the keystone. We don't have a plan, and there, there are things on the table that need to be decided. You are also an advocate of wind energy. There has been a wind production tax credit which has expired. Critics of wind energy say it's not profitable unless there's that government prop up of the tax credit. What's your view of wind energy and its profitability? I am an expert on wind. You know how you get to be an expert? <laughs> Lose $200 million, okay? That's what I lost in the wind business. And so... Uh, and why uh, was that? Why? Yes. Uh, I, you can't wind uh, economically uh, cannot uh, compete unless natural gas is $6. And natural gas went all the way to $2. I got in it, natural gas was $9. I should have hedged my position. I'm gonna you know, tell it all, brother, that I should have hedged my position at that point, did not, because I believe natural gas prices would go up higher. If they did, I would make more money in the wind business. I, I, that seems to argue, you know, we're building wind towers all across Iowa mm -hmm. for wind energy. And people listening to you here must be saying, is Iowa making a big mistake? Are, are energy companies making a big mistake in establishing well, wind you, towers in Iowa? I don't, I mean, the PTC, uh, their, their wind deals, they're not, people in Iowa are smart people. And if they're building turbines and they're, they know what they're gonna sell the power for, and if they have a PTC, which we did have, I think, it's, I think it still exists. The tax uh, credit. The tax credit. For, but, for construction that commenced, but it's going to end. It, well, they may renew it. <laughs> uh, they get a chance to, you know, this year, mm -hmm. to renew it. And the PTC that we didn't think would be renewed the last time was what, it, it was, it, it was a, I took a big loss in on that. I, I absolutely went the wrong direction twice, and you can't do that in big deals. And so consequently, and I'm out of the wind business now. And, uh, but the, uh, uh, but you, $6, if you follow through on this, $6 an MCF for gas will make wind work. And wind is about, I think, the second cheapest for power generation now. You don't use oil for power generation in the United States. I mean, it's way too expensive to do that. And so, and solar is is too expensive still. There's some things to be worked out there. But but wind is, it's it's close at $6. Gas today is $4.95. I look at it very early in the morning, then I look at it all day, and then I put it to bed at night. But anyway. <laughs> we're, moving, we're moving along here, uh, and, and, and really interesting conversation on energy, but we have some other questions too, okay? Or Jim? Well, you, I know earlier you, you had mentioned uh, Iowa's role in, in uh, the presidential caucuses and winnowing the field, and you said you hoped that uh, Iowans would do their job uh, in the coming cycle. Um, a couple Texans are in that field right now, Senator Ted Cruz and Governor Rick Perry, are potential 2016 presidential candidates. Wondering uh, if you can give Iowa caucus goers any advice on, on 
the leadership qualities and, and presidential potential of these characters? Of these two, yes. Cru Cruz and uh, Perry? Perry. Uh, I don't think either one of them will make it to the finish line. I don't think they'll be the candidate for the Republican Party. And uh, uh, we got to look at Perry in the last election and didn't stay in the race very long. Uh, Cruz is, uh, is a little bit early. You'd pick him green if you took him now. And uh, so I, I just don't see either one of them being uh, serious players. Do you have a favorite uh, go looking at 2016? Do you uh, see somebody It's kind of interesting on Christie of the, the George Washington Bridge. Uh, it's called, uh, Christie's gonna have to deal with that uh, for a while. I don't know, on, uh, I don't have to pick today. And uh, I think Jeb Bush will get in the race somewhere. And uh, so it's, uh, the Republicans haven't done very well. Well, you, you, you say you made a bad bet on wind energy. Uh, who, you, who would you place your money on? Who would you contribute to right now? Well, that again, I don't have to contribute now. I'm not ready to pick. Uh, I want to see everybody's going to get in this uh, deal. The, the Republicans should have a, a great opportunity uh, with very simply the lack of leadership of the president of uh, Obama today. I mean, nobody today would classify him a leader. And if you look at his record uh, when he was elected, he had no no credentials, none, zero. And uh, you and I will got to start uh, weeding these people out and and giving us uh, the best candidates all, and all. And uh, but uh, there should be some method to screen p presidential candidates. There who, should. Who would do it? Well, you know, uh, you know, if it, let's let's go to corporate America first and back go back into the question. But in corporate America, you'd use headhunters. If you wanted to find a CEO for a company in America, you'd tell headhunters, this is what we want. Find us candidates, bring them to us. We want to look at three candidates. And th that's the job those people have. Now, I don't know, <laughs> anyway, there's got to be a better method for how people get to be uh, run for president of the United States. Um, in 2004, you were involved in Swift Boat Veterans, the group that uh, questioned John Kerry's military record. Do you have any regrets about that? Do you think that, or do you think that was an investment of $2 million that was worth it on your part? It was more than that. How much? <laughs> I, think it, I think that Harold Simmons and Bob Perry and I had something like 15 or 20 million in it. Do you intend to do that kind of investing in presidential politics in the future? Tough question, but I mean, I don't know what the circumstances would be. That that brought me in because uh, I believe it was it was exactly the right thing to do. The record was not clear, and we went to the nine ads that we ran, and I made statement. Uh, in a speech in New York, I said, if anybody can show me uh, a factual error in the nine ads that we did, uh, I'll give you a million dollars. Well, I had all kinds of com you know, stuff came in about, about books had been written that had mistakes in them. That isn't what I said. I said the nine ads that we ran, I saw all of those in production. I saw all of them completed. I sat and talked to the people that had put it all together is this factually correct? I don't want to be embarrassed by a mistake in any ad. And uh, never did anybody come up and say, hey, look, this is not right. Newsweek came out and said we used voiceover. And I, I really, <laughs> I couldn't believe what I heard. It was in Newsweek magazine. And I immediately got in touch. I said, fellas, did we use voiceover? No, that is Carrie's voice all the way through. It is not voiceover. Newsweek will make the correction next week, which they did. They retracted. There are critics of people who, uh, such as yourself, invest that much in politics. They're critics of the Citizens United decision. Do you think there's too much money in politics? 
Oh, probably, but I don't, I don't know what you're going to do about it. I mean, they, there's limits, $2,500, you know what I mean, but mm -hmm. then there, there are openings if you want to go in and do some things, if super PACs and all this. The politicians, they'll, they'll fix it so they can get all the money that, that is available. Um, you, you have also donated a lot of money to your alma mater, Oklahoma State University. Uh, you've particularly donated to the sports programs. I'm wondering if you think if athletes at the collegiate level should be paid or have some sort of stipend, why, are, why is it the coaches that are paid handsomely but the athletes aren't? Well, let me uh, offer something else. You said uh, the athletics. I've given over $500 million to Oklahoma State, and it's split about 50-50 with academic and athletics. So it's... Uh, we have a different university, I think. Uh, Iowa State, being in Big 12 with us and all, they know what we've done. You've watched us closely. We have made huge changes in the university, and we think that we're now on, on the same level with our biggest rival, which is OU. And uh, not that Iowa State isn't a rival, too. You guys beat us two years ago up here. <laughs> Knock, knocked us out of the national championship game. And we're, I was here for that. We're down to less than a minute. And then Kay asked, you know, what do you think about paying collegiate athletes? You know, I've been in that discussion many times. And, the, and I was a, a uh, scholarship athlete at Texas A&M. And uh, the, I don't know exactly how you do it, but I know these, these uh, uh, athletes come to school, they have nothing. Now they have uh, a room, they have room and board, they have, a, uh, uh, they have tuition paid, they have tutors. Uh, they're getting an education if they really want it. Sounds to me. Sounds to me like you're putting off the decision on whether or not to pay them in the future. And I, I have, with that, I just have to say thanks a lot for spending time with us today. Sure. Thank you. Well, next week, Governor Terry Branstad will be here at the Iowa Press Table. We'll talk about his political agenda and the upcoming election. And you'll see that program at our usual time, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. I'm Dean Borg. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Iowa banks know you want honest advice about how to best reach your financial goals, whether it's financing and education, buying a new home, growing a business, or funding retirement. Iowa banks, Iowa values. MyIowaBank.com Iowa Communications Network. ICN's connectivity offers Iowa's rural hospitals and clinics access to telemedicine opportunities. Iowans can eliminate distance barriers by receiving medical treatment closer to home using remote specialists located miles away. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations. Connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about. For good. For Iowa. Forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure.